Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to once again say how glad I am to see you here. We are glad that each of us, I hope each of us, is glad that we were able to be here to worship the Lord, as we talked about yesterday, of course, in, in the lesson and, and, and there at the end of the meeting. Of course, worshiping, one of the purposes of our being here is indeed to worship God. We know we are here also to edify one another now, in a sense, and, and, and thinking about it, uh, in a sense, so we understand that our edifying one another is not worship of God. We know that. We're not worshiping one another. But we do see that we are uh, edifying each other while we, are, while we are worshiping our Lord. And what a joy it is that we are able to do so. We're able to come here and, and to edify one another and admonish one another. And what a blessing it is. I would ask you to, to bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we humbly bow before you in prayer. We praise you, exalt you. We thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. Father, we ask that you watch over us and, and strengthen us, help us to be faithful and true to you, Father. We pray that as we go through this worship service, that all things will be done in accordance with your will, that all things will be done in a pleasing manner, will be acceptable to you. Father, we pray that as we examine your word, that we will be diligent in our studies, true to your word, that we will apply these things appropriately to our own lives and live accordingly, Father. We pray these things humbly in Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, preaching is of great importance. I don't say that because I am a preacher. I am a preacher, but I don't, I don't make that statement because I am a preacher. I don't make that statement because I'm trying to exalt myself or pat myself on the back. I state that, make that statement because it's simply the truth. It is true. Preaching is of great importance. Brother Stapleton, the former director of the school, when he, was, when he was director, would often say, and I don't know where he got this from, but would often say that preaching is as serious as a heart attack. Now, he may have told us where he got it from, but I don't recall. I do remember the statement, but I don't recall hearing where it necessarily <laughs> came from. But in that statement, we see that preaching is indeed of great importance. We read a text. We read a few moments ago in 1 Corinthians chapter eight, chapter 1 and verse 18. We read that verse, and, and when we read in context, as we're going to do, we see indeed how important preaching is. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21, it is through the foolishness of preaching that God decided to save man. We understand. I want us to spend a, a brief amount of time here looking at the context here, and then I want us to answer the question that we ultimately are going to get at in today's lesson is, what did, what has the cross done for us? What has the cross done for us? What has the cross done for you? What has it done for me? And we need to understand that. We need to ask that question of what it has done for me. Now we know in context, in a broader context, the, the letter here, 1 Corinthians, is dealing with many different errors that were in the Corinthian church, where they are writing, where Paul is writing to the Corinthians and, and addressing issues that were problems there, telling them to straighten up. If you were here yesterday, you, you recall, I'm sure, hopefully you recall, I don't remember which speaker, but but one of the speakers pointed out how that in this letter, go listen to all the lessons, you'll find it, but but one of the speakers had, had pointed out that here it deals with all these problems that are in the Corinthian church. Now you go back and read 2 Corinthians and you read, were they fixed problems? Now they weren't perfect at, at any point, but they fixed problems. One of the problems that they were dealing with, and you see... Broadly, more broadly speaking, dealt with in the first four chapters was division. 
A problem that we still see in the, the church today, division where we divide over such silly things. We're not talking about brethren going off into error and refusing to repent and therefore you can't have anything to do with them. But, but you see division over some silly things. You, you see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and beginning with verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul here encouraging them to be united. And then he goes on to talk about various ways they are divided. Preacheritis being one of them, as we often refer uh, to it. You know, of, of I like this preacher, I like that preacher, and that's nothing new. Uh, we certainly, or it certainly hasn't been done away with. We see that it was a problem there, and it's still a problem today. Where we get into that worrying about, I like this preacher and I like that preacher, when it's never about the preacher. It shouldn't be. If he's making it about himself, he's doing wrong. And if we as Christians are making it about him, then we are doing wrong. But but he he talks about that, and then he goes on a text that I I, I submit to you is often often misapplied by so many denominationalists. You see here, and he, he talks, and we're not going to read the whole section here, but, but he goes on and he starts talking about, you know, some saying, verse 12, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Verse 13. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? And then verse 14, again, which is so often misunderstood, misapplied. I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether... I baptized any. And then the verse that really is misunderstood. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, they will. many denominationalists will grab that verse. I said verse 14, but verse 17 here. Many people will grab that and say, See, Paul wasn't sent. To baptize, so baptism isn't all that important. To those who make that mistake, and it is a mistake, I would encourage you to go back and read Acts chapter 18 and verse 8, where we are told many of them were baptized. Just because Paul wasn't doing it doesn't mean it wasn't getting done. Doesn't mean that it wasn't important. But to our point, we are introduced here, verse 17, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. We are introduced to our, our idea here of, of the cross, our topic, the cross, what the cross does for us. And Paul here doesn't want the cross to be made of none effect, to be devalued. Now briefly, I want us to ask this question. Before we continue, what is Paul talking about when he says the cross? When we get into the question that is at hand, what has the cross done for us? What has it done for me? What has it done for you? What are we talking about the cross? Are we talking about this inanimate object that, that someone put up? And we often get this idea of the cross. And by the way, the idea of the cross that we see isn't completely... Uh, the way that the cross was, but but this idea of the cross uh, of these two boards put together, where they were nailed. I'm not saying that that they that Jesus wasn't nailed to the cross or anything. Don't get me wrong. But but this idea uh, that are we talking about that piece of wood that was put together and and where he was nailed to this cross and how is that what is being discussed here when Paul talks about the cross, and ultimately, as we're going to see, as we, we see here in the context, the power of the cross. Is that what he's talking about? Now, it's certainly included, but it goes beyond this inanimate object. He is ultimately getting to the, the beyond the object, he is getting to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He is getting to the sacrifice. We 
We partook of the Lord's Supper a few moments ago, and He is getting to the sacrifice of Christ. So as we go through and we talk about what did the, the cross of Christ do, what did the cross do, understand the, the inanimate object that was there, that was used, is not what did anything for you. It is ultimately the sacrifice that did something for you. One of my pet peeves, and, and maybe I let it bother me a little too much, but one of my pet peeves uh, that we often hear preachers talk about, I heard one say it yesterday, and I'm not taking a dispute with him and what he said, but we often get to Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, and we understand that the Catholics take the idea that Peter was the foundation. He was that rock misinterpretation, misunderstanding, misapplication to say Peter was the foundation. Peter wasn't the foundation. But some will take and say that it is the confession. Brothers and sisters, I submit it isn't the confession that Peter made. It is the very foundation. Now, let me be careful how I say this. Because the confession, what the person who says this, any person who says this is ultimately getting at is still pointing to Christ. Christ is the foundation. Read what Paul said uh, to the Corinthians about it, uh, how that uh, there, there is no other foundation. Christ is the foundation. But, but the confession is based upon the foundation. Uh, the, the confession is based on Christ. So, so it all ties in together. But, you know, we need, so we need to be careful how he said things, and I, uh, I don't want to make too much of an exaggeration about that. So, um, but but I say that to to relate back to what we're saying. That, you know, when we think of the cross, it, it doesn't mean again that idea of this inanimate object. It is the the it is more than that, and so we we need to understand that. But our text here that we're looking at in First Corinthians chapter one. And, and, and we see here this introduction uh, in verse 17, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And then in verse 18, our text, which we read a few moments ago, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Now, I want to stop for a few moments and, and think about that statement. To those who perish, those who are lost, the, the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the sacrifice that he made is foolishness. It's useless. How stupid, how silly it is to say that this man, because of course that's what they get at, this good man that many people profess Jesus was, and I'm not saying Jesus wasn't a good man, but we know he was more than just simply a good man. But this, this good man that was nailed to the cross, he was, he was crucified, he was put to death, he was put in that grave and he's dead. And to say that, that the Son of God, to say that God, deity himself, came down, took upon himself the image of a man, became a man, died on the cross, was buried in that tomb, rose the third day, and he'll never die again, is foolishness to those who are perishing. And there's what Paul is getting at here. Preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But there's the alternative. But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. When I was studying for this, this lesson, when I was looking over uh, and reading these texts and, and such, I could not help but think, and I don't know if I've ever made the, the connection before, but I could not help but think in reading that statement there in verse 18 of, of how to those of us who are saved, it is the power of God. I could not help, and I, I'm hoping that more than I have, have thought of this, of Romans 1.16. Well, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I can't help but see a connection there. You know, the, the preaching of the cross is the same thing as preaching the gospel. Preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, I want you to understand that there are those who, who will look at these, this the context here, look at these things, 
And they will make the argument, again, as we've already touched on, that, that well, baptism isn't necessary because Paul said he didn't come Christ and sin to, to baptize, no, but to preach. We've already touched on that. We've already shown that that is not what is being taught here. It is not teaching that baptism is not necessary. But it also, people will misuse this and say that, you know, when we start talking about preaching the cross, when we start talking about preaching the gospel, that it is simply the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and there is nothing more to do that. Brothers and sisters, that is not what this text is teaching either. Go read about the Ethiopian eunuch. Go read there in Acts chapter 8, and where that Philip preached Jesus, starting over in Isaiah 53 and verse 7, and how he preached Jesus unto him, and it brought the Ethiopian eunuch to the point where he looked and he said, See, here is water what doth hinder me to be baptized. Read Isaiah 53. You don't read baptism in Isaiah 53. And yet something was said to him in preaching Jesus that included baptism. So we need to be careful how we, we interpret, how we understand things. But today, brothers and sisters, I want us to get to our point here. You know, we, we say all these things and they're important to understand. That they're connected to what we're looking at. But we get to our point of what has the cross done for us? And on a personal note, what has it done for me? I want us to see, beginning with Colossians chapter 2 and verse, verse 14, excuse me, that it has abolished the old law. Paul here writing to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. I shared with the congregation here before that it, it fascinates me, and I didn't originate this idea. I had someone, one of my teachers in school point this out. Uh, but it just fascinates me, the connection here blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. And, and do you remember how God wrote the Ten Commandments? He took his finger and wrote with his finger, it said, the handwriting of the ordinances. He nailed those, that old law to the cross. And this, he had abolished it. You see, because you and I, we're not Jews, we wouldn't be under the old law anyway. And all those Gentiles, all those nations, not included the Israelites, of course. The Israelites, the old law, people try to hold to the old law today. People who would never be under the old law in the first place. And, and, and of course, as the Word of God points out, the Jews were never able to keep it anyway. They were never able to fulfill the law. They didn't obey the law and follow through and fulfill it. There is only one individual who ever was able to do that. Whoever did so. And who was that? Jesus Christ. He is the only one who kept the whole law. And if you sin in one part of the law, guess what you have done? You have sinned against the whole law. cross abolished that. Colossians 1 verse 20 and as we go through these some of these, you know, as we look at these, I want you to keep in mind that these are all tied in together. They all get to the same point which we've already alluded to if you're paying attention, you, you see where all this brings us to, brothers and sisters. Colossians 1 and verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Now, who and what is being discussed here in verse 20? 
back up just a little bit. We'll read, beginning in verse 14. In whom, and in these texts, in Ephesians and, and here in Colossians, Ephesians and Colossians, twins, twin epistles, as they often are, are called, in whom, in Christ, in whom we have redemption, through His blood, the blood of Christ, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, or all things were created by Him and, and for Him. Verse 17, And He is before all things, and by Him... All things consist, and He is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Talking about Christ. Verse 19, notice the, For it pleased the Father that in Him, in Christ, should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him, to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So we see here talking about Christ and his preeminence and, and, and so forth. And it is the Father, verse 19, who through Christ decided to what? To reconcile all things unto himself. To reconcile what? All things and us, all of us, because as we read in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, what does sin do? Separates us from him. Brings death, Romans 6 and verse 23, we were separated, we were apart from him because of our own sins. And he decided through the cross, through the sacrifice, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, in fact, to reconcile us. Which ties in, by the way, with, with what, we, we would re, what we have read and what we later read in, in context here in chapter 2 and verse 14, which the old law was enmity. You remember the old law was enmity. Because it separated the Jews and the Gentiles. So he reconciled, by the way, the Jews and the Gentiles, made all one, one people, essentially. Uh, we don't have to become Jews in order to be saved, which is what the Judaizing teachers were teaching, that you had to become a Jew and obey the law. You had to be circumcised in order to, become, in order to even be saved. But we don't have to do that. Jews have to obey the gospel. The Gentiles have to obey the gospel. If we're black, if we're white, if we're Hispanic, if we're Asian, if we're whatever, we have to obey the same gospel. And it doesn't matter. As I mentioned yesterday, Acts chapter 17 amazes me the more I read it. The things that are taught. Yes, Paul there deals, was dealing with idolatry, but, but he dealt with racism there. We're all made of one blood. And it doesn't matter who we are. Uh, uh, we're, we're all <coughs> able to obey the gospel. Romans 1 and verse 16, we, we read, quoted part of that. I want you to notice all of it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter who you are. The cross brings reconciliation to God. No matter what. His death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel, obeying the gospel, brings salvation to you. And there's what we are ultimately getting at what the cross did for you and for me. You know, we, we, we say, we use words like reconciliation. Paul used the word 
reconciliation here in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. In the letter to the Ephesians in, in chapter 1 and verse 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Redemption. Reconciliation. Redemption. I think we're all intelligent enough to understand reconciliation, rec being reconciled with someone or something, being redeemed, being bought back, we might say. We know uh, Mark 10 and verse 45 uh, that Christ paid the ransom, if you will. I think we understand what those words are, but maybe sometimes we look at those words and maybe we don't make the connection. I, I hope we do make the connection, but but do we understand ultimately what is that word that we are getting at? Salvation. Salvation, brothers and sisters. What did the cross do for, for me? What did it do for you? What did that sacrifice, that death, burial, and resurrection of Christ do for us? It, it gave us the opportunity to be saved. I started to say it gave us salvation, and, and it did but really it gives us the opportunity because not everyone will obey the gospel, will they? You see, many people take and look at a text like where we were earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and looking in context there, and they, they take it and they start misapplying, misquoting texts, uh, misunderstanding these texts, and, and they start dismissing baptism, or they start uh, doing this or that with it, and and they look at Romans 1 and verse 16, the, the gospel is the power of God to salvation, and that's preaching the cross. And, and so it's just a matter of all what Christ did. And after all, he said, it is finished. So it was all done there. It was finished on the cross. He fulfilled all that he had to do, making salvation available to you to me his part was done his part being grace the grace of God we're saved by grace Ephesians 2 verses 8 through 10 the grace of God of course has appeared to all men Titus 2 verse 11 it makes we understand it makes available salvation God's grace is there for each of us but we have the choice of whether we obey the gospel. We have the choice of whether we do. We read this and we ask the question, what did the cross do for me? And I think we've answered that. I think the Word of God has answered that for us, of what it does for us. The question that we need to ask is, what are we going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? What, what are others going to do with the cross? We, we see it, and, and this is, you know, I talked about pet peeves. Sometimes we let our pet peeves bother us a little too much. I, I, I actually, I kind of wonder where that term came from, pet peeves. What is a peeve anyway? But Pet peeves, the little things that annoy us. Those little crosses annoy me to an extent. Now, if you have a cross, don't get upset. I'm not, I'm not saying you're sinning because you have a little cross. You know, sometimes we wear a cross around our neck, or we, some, I know ladies, sometimes you'll have a little cross, bracelets. I don't generally see guys wearing bracelets, but, you know, you see ladies wearing crosses on their bracelets or whatnot. And, and, and I don't guess it's in and of itself, it's the little crosses that bother me. It's, it's what people often do. But somehow that we think, and, and there are many people in this world, today is, as you probably know, Palm Sunday. And there are many people in the religious world who make a big deal about Palm Sunday. And next week I saw, I went and picked Sister Mary up, and I passed by one of the denominations here in town, and they said they were invited to come and celebrate Easter with us. Brothers and sisters, where do you read in the Bible anything about Easter? Now, somebody might say, well, wait a minute. Oh, you turn over the book of Acts. And the King James Version used the word Easter. 
But if you misunderstand, if you if you don't pay attention, you misunderstand that that's mistranslation. It should have been Passover. King James. We often hear people talk about how perfect King James is. There are problems with King James. There's one of them. Easter. Easter is is not should not end there. What is that? Acts twelve and verse four. I believe it is. It is. And, and I in my Bible, I just have the word Easter crossed out. Passover is what it's supposed to be. We are not told to celebrate Easter. We, we, we celebrate, if you will, the death of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ each Lord's day, each first day of the week. When we take the Lord's Supper, there's a memorial that Christ set up, not Easter. And we need to understand that. Easter is actually a, a, a taken from paganism. <laughs> But people say that, and before I get bogged down in that, but people people take that, and somehow if I show up at Easter, it's kind of like I mentioned yesterday, you know, the, the Burlington advertisement where the little girl, they're, they're talking about getting dressed up for Easter, and we go to church. Well, that should be the only time we go to church services, is Easter. But people wear the little crosses, and you meet people who, who will do that to the extent, again, if you, if you want to wear a cross, I'm not going to get upset with you or anything, but if you, if you, there are people who wear a cross, and somehow they think that makes them holy. And brothers and sisters, that little inanimate, inanimate object is not going to make you or me or anybody else holy. There are many Catholics who have little pieces of the cross, they say. It is calculated that if you took all the little pieces of the cross that people have, you'd have more than enough to make the cross. I think you get the point there. They don't have pieces of the cross. Uh, just like that brazen serpent that they could look to, the Israelites could look to if they got uh, bitten by a snake and they were healed, what did they ultimately later start doing? They started worshiping this, this thing as an idol. Somehow this thing was doing it for them, not recognizing that it was God who was doing it for them. And, and that inanimate object of the cross isn't doing a thing for them. It is death, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ that is doing it for them. And we need to keep that in mind. And, and, and we have an obligation to respond accordingly. Now back to that question, what? will you do? We see what it does, what that sacrifice does. What will you do? Will you respond? Will you obey the gospel? The Bible tells you that you must hear the word of God because it is where faith comes from. That we must have faith in order to be saved. It tells us that we must repent of our sins. You must repent of your sins. Not someone else's. You must confess Christ to be the Son of God. You must be baptized, immersed in water. See, here is, is water. What does hinder me? What does hinder you to be baptized? And when you do so, you come in contact with the blood of Christ, which is what washes away your sins and reconciles you with Christ, because as we've read in, in these various verses, there's what is being gotten at, right? The blood of Christ that was shed on that cross. What will you do? You've heard what the cross does for you. What will you do? Will you sit there and say, well, that's good. That's good, preacher. That's good, Robert. The cross does that. Ooh, I'm relaxed now. Will you obey the gospel? Will you respond? Maybe you're here and you're a Christian. Maybe you look at yourself and you just say, I haven't been what I need to be. We didn't look at any of these do's and don'ts today. Maybe, maybe though, there's some sin in your life. Or, or maybe something was said today. Maybe something you heard yesterday and it's really got you to thinking. Or maybe you heard, you just know. You just know. You, you've been doing something you ought not to do or you've not been doing something you ought to do. 
And you know you need to respond. You know you need to correct that. Maybe it's a private issue. Go to God. Seek His forgiveness. Maybe, though, it's not a private issue. Maybe everybody knows about it. So often we think, I'm the only one who knows. When in reality, everybody knows. You know, I'm the only one who knows that I like to talk. Now, talking, by the way, isn't necessarily a sin. Although the Bible does warn us about running our mouths off more than we need to. You know, read Proverbs about that one. But, you know, nobody else knows I like to talk, right? I'm the only one who knows. Well, if I think that, I'm not thinking. Because everybody knows I like to talk. Maybe, maybe I'm the only one who knows I, I stole that. No, I didn't steal something. But maybe they only, nobody else knows I stole that. Maybe nobody else knows I, I, I did that. Maybe nobody else knows I've sinned in this way. Well, maybe they don't, but chances are... Probably there's somebody who does know. But whatever the case is, we've been told if we are faithful to confess our faults, He's faithful to forgive us. If you're here today, if you have need, we encourage you, we plead with you to come while we stand and while we sing. All things are ready. Come to the